Good afternoon. I'll call this General Services Public Works Committee meeting to order. Today is July 12th, 2021, and we're meeting here in the library community room at noon. And with me today, I have Council Member Dan English. We have four <laughs> items on the agenda today and one presentation um, from our new library director, Michael Priest. But to start us off, we have Dennis Grant, our engineering project manager. For item number one, which is vacation of a 10-foot strip of right-of-way adjoining the easterly boundary line of lot 22 and the south half of lot 21, block three. Thank you very much, Council. Good afternoon. And uh, we have two vacations today on the agenda, and they're both similar. They're both on 18th Street. Uh, uh, very similar um, staff reports you'll see, too, also. Um, the applicant, Todd Butler, uh, is requesting the vacation of what you stated, the 10-foot strip of land. They're on 18th, 401 South 18th Street, and I have a picture of it on the screen on the TV out there for you guys out there in uh, TV land. And uh, the requested right-of-way was uh, originally d dedicated to the public in 1907, and the uh, vacation of the requested right-of-way would, would not have any financial impact on the city and would add approximately 600 square feet, which is this area right there, uh, to the county tax roll. Uh, it's a minor amount, but it's a benefit to the city as tax revenue and to the landowner right here that adjoins that piece of uh, land. Uh, the portion of 18th Street has an 80-foot right-of-way, which is not normal, but back in the day, uh, for whatever reason, I, I don't know, uh, in 1907, maybe that was the main road back back then uh, to, uh, I know the mill that used to be down there in that, that area, and now the, the resort golf course, but... Um, so there was an 80-foot right-of-way, and uh, by vacating the requested 10-foot strip of right-of-way, it would be more consistent with a typical 60-foot right-of-way of, uh, of all the streets south of Sherman Avenue. Uh, the right-of-way can be incorporated into the development to the adjoining property, as stated before, and all the t utilities are existing and in place, and there is no foreseeable use of this right-of-way. Uh, the development re review team was informed about this vacation. Uh, the, sta uh, rec the recommendation is uh, the, that council proceed with the vacation process as outlined in Idaho Code Section 50-1306 and recommend setting August 3rd, 2021 as the date for the public hearing on this item. Any questions? questions? Well, just yeah. in, in general, I assume these usually come up because there's some benefit i mean they're looking to add on and need more right away or they just want to improve the sale price of the property there's or? probably some i know with uh, this gentleman here on this property i believe he wants to uh, pull a building permit and expand mm -hmm. uh, his resident and possibly do an adu or something like that so sure. that would help him with uh, setbacks sure and there's nothing in our code where people need to justify a reason or anything well the only just no not well the only justification we have is the there is 80 foot right away which mm. we'll never use sure uh, that's really the only justification sure okay um and plus this is for the uh, setting of a public hearing that we can right, uh, discuss right, some more right. further if we like well then uh given that and no other comments <laughs> i would Recommend that council proceed with the vacation process as outlined in Idaho Code Section 501-1306 and set a public hearing for August 3rd, 2021. I'll second your motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion passes. And Dennis, you have another vacation for us today. Okay, uh, yes, uh, again, for a, to set a public hearing date for the August uh, 3rd. Um, this is similar to the staff report, so I won't go over some of this, but it is located at 1724 East Young. It's still on 18th Street, but it, this one happens to be on the corner, the southwest corner of Young and 18th Street, and it's the same strip of land uh, that they're requesting. 
Um, this is uh, also Todd Butler on behalf of Savannah Hill, who owns that property there. He's doing uh, uh, both of them and representing Savannah Hill in this case. Um, it also has the 80-foot right-of-way, like I was mentioning before. And uh, there, there is room to vacate, and uh, we, uh, we don't see any foreseeable use for that property. Utilities are existing. Uh, there also, and, and the DRT uh, folks uh, looked at it also, and uh, the staff recommends that council proceed with the vacation process as outlined by section 50-1306 and recommend setting the August 3rd, 2021 as the date for a public hearing on this item. Any questions on that? Pretty straightforward. Any questions? Nope. Otherwise, then I would make a motion to recommend that council proceed with vacation process as outlined in Idaho Code Section 50-1306 and set a public hearing for August 3rd, 2021. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Dennis. Next item on the agenda is a request for approval of letter of agreement with Jace Perry do, doing business as Backwoods Whiskey Bar for commercial use of city streets for recreational transit. And we have Kelly Setters with us today, our deputy city clerk. Hi, Kelly. Hi. Um, I'm here today to bring forward a request from Jace Perry, as you said, um, from the Backwood Whiskey Bar, which was the hogfish. <clears throat> he took that over. And he wants to do like a taxi cab type thing from his facility down into Coeur d'Alene and back. And no alcohol would be served. It's similar, we did one in 2014, the city approved a similar request to operate a non-motorized vehicle within the city limits with a letter of agreement. And it was socially geared cycle pub. That was one with alcohol on it. As you see here, it's like a bicycle with just a couple seats in the back. And then um, staff is recommending approval of the requests for the ped cab services by Backwoods Whiskey Bar through a letter of agreement. Uh, Mr. Perry affirmed there would be no alcohol on the, on the bike carriage. It is just for transportation for clients to go to and from downtown from First Street up to East Sherman to the Hogfish um, Backwood Whiskey Bar it's on 20th street from 3 p.m to 1 a.m wednesday through saturday and the bike has an electric assist that goes up to 15 miles an hour um, this is an allowable commercial use on city streets per municipal code uh, 5.18 with council consent of course the agreement sets forth the term and standards for the operation of the commercial vehicle upon city streets including the clause that the city may add conditions or revoke the permit if it is deemed necessary to maintain the safety of the city liability insurance will be required um, the fee for this permit would cost jace 150 dollars which is the same amount we charge for outdoor eating establishments on city right away um, council should approve a letter of agreement with jace perry for commercial use on the city streets for recreational transit. I stand for any questions you may have. And Jace is here as well if you have any for him. I don't have any questions. I just want to note that each city department was contacted to see if there was any concerns um, with this request, and there was none. And especially I'd like to note that the police department had no issues with this request. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm certainly, I'm, Actually, I encourage that we've got, if we have uh, more uh, uh, options for folks going back and forth. But just curious if if the only on and off points will be kind of at the end of the line for each way, or if if they're kind of, I don't know, they were going down for whatever reason, empty, dropped somebody off, and they came back and partway at Seventh and Sherman, somebody wanted to flag them down but you know potentially holding up traffic or something what do you have in mind for what if what it'll be plan, James, as far as controlled come up. Come up. controlled on and off points okay. or yeah the whole goal is to reduce drinking and driving and provide a community uh thing in return for you know putting a logo on the back 
Right. Um, right. So we're not charging anybody tips or donation if they want right. a tip. But as, I was more thinking if somebody, um, if like say you were at your establishment took somebody down, you know, almost a city park and and they wanted to get off, right. and then you're going back empty, and somebody goes to flag you down, what do you do? It'd be similar like Uber or taxi. We would pull aside to the curb and let them okay. come on and and then get back into sure. the right away and sure. very similar. And traffic usually then is moving pretty slow so yeah. <laughs> downtown. But uh, yeah. yeah, no, I the think it sounds good to uh, take a look at it. So. so I guess given that, I would recommend that council approve the letter of agreement with Jace Perry doing business as Backwoods Whiskey Bar for commercial use of city streets for recreational transit. I'll second that, and I just have one more comment. I have some experience with pedicabs um, in town, and just start training. <laughs> Those things can't, well, this one has an assist, so that's, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it helps a lot. Yeah. yeah, they're super fun. Great idea, and I appreciate you um, looking for safe options to transport people. Yes, of course. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Our fourth item today is a request for authorization to purchase one live scan plus fingerprinting machine and related equipment. With us, we have Renata McLeod, our Municipal Services Director. Okay, I am here because this is an item that was not included in our original budget request for this fiscal year. Um, we do have some salary savings. We had a network specialist position that took us a little bit of time to find the right fit. Um, so we weren't able to fill that position until recently. So we do have some additional funds that were unexpected in our department budget. And we issue business licenses that require fingerprinting. And at this point in time, we've always partnered with the police department because they have a machine located there. And we would send our people up there to do the fingerprints. And then we did it on fingerprint cards back in the day. And they'd send them down to the state. The state would process it. And then we would get a printed background check. Well, now things have changed and it's electronic submittal. Um, but at the same point, the police department's pretty busy and they only have certain scheduled days where you can go down and fingerprint. So people will come down here, apply for their license, fill out some paperwork, and then they have to travel over to the police department to get their fingerprints and only on certain days of the week. So we issue about 626 licenses that require fingerprints. Not every year do they have to be renewed. But we just really believe it's probably time for us to invest in our own machine. It certainly is better customer service for us to be able to perform the function here. Um, what I have up on the screen is a picture of what the machine looks like. Um, really, it's just a machine that's hooked up to a network cable. Uh, the fingerprints go into the machine and get filed directly with the state. So there's no issue about um, user information being disclosed, nothing comes back to us on this machine. We get an email link to the state website and it's available through the state website for 30 days. We're able to see if the people qualify for business licenses and then move on from there. But really, we just feel like this would be a great customer service opportunity. The machine's between eleven dollars and $12,000. Um, they offer training for $1,000 to come on site and train our staff how to do the fingerprints. Um, our police department has agreed to do that for us, so we would save ourselves $1,000. Um, so we're still partnering with them. In addition to that, if their machine ever goes down, they could come down to City Hall and use our machine. And if ours is ever down, we can still um, send folks up to the police department to use their machine. So we just think it's a great idea and a great opportunity, and we would love your support. I stand for any questions. Well, no question, but yeah, I think it's a terrific idea whose time is probably <laughs> overdue. I've been on the other side both as a volunteer wanting to do something and as a uh, employer who needs, uh, you know, the background, I mean, fingerprint um, capability is so just so common and necessary these days. So I think that that is terrific. The more that we can kind of eliminate some of the choke points, uh, I mean, 
seems like just at our meeting the other night, something came up where <laughs> the, the state couldn't handle some process in time, and so some poor person is kind of victimized by the process, and so, yeah, I think this is terrific, and as long as you wish, reassure me that nobody can vote twice on it, uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> or it won't be hooked up to the, <laughs> you yeah. know. It's to, a, it's uh, a one-way line yeah, going yeah. down to the ISP, so. Yeah. So, no, mm -hmm. I think this is a good, like I say, good customer service and good to have some redundancy in place, so. And I agree. So given that, I would recommend that council approve the purchase of one Live scan plus fingerprinting machine and related equipment. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Renata. Thank you. And our last item on our agenda today is a presentation from library director Michael Priest. And Michael, it's so great to uh, meet you in person and welcome to General Services. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, so let's talk about the library. Uh, so some updates, successes, and goals for the immediate future. So I'll start with our mission. Uh, we are committed to excellence in library services dedicated to lifelong learning. The library provides free and equal access to a full range of historical, intellectual, and cultural resources. So for me, what this means is we offer materials. That's the obvious thing. And it's not just books, it's a whole range of different things. We have video games, audio books, Roku's, uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, a little bit of, of everything in a lot of ways, and we're always looking to expand what we offer to the community. Uh, we also offer programs for all ages. Uh, this is becoming a huge part of what we do. We offer children's services, teen services, and adult services. And then occasionally we mix it all up and blend services for everybody, all ages uh, programming. We're a community space for study, for research, uh, for people who have information questions to meet and gather. Uh, we have the meeting rooms, of course, that are, are well used by the public. Uh, and a big part moving forward is outreach. So there's people who come to the library, it's a great facility, but we also have a responsibility to all those living outside uh, and the city as a whole uh, and to meet them where they are. So we're doing a lot of programming at schools, at daycares, uh, senior centers, community events. We need to be where people are. So in terms of organization, uh, per Idaho Code, Chapter 26, Title 33, uh, the city establishes a library board of trustees, an independent board of five members. Uh, so their responsibilities are policy for the library, they prepare a budget for uh, council to approve. They administrate, uh, administer the, the expenditure of that budget once approved. Uh, and they also hire and evaluate the library director. So the library director looks, uh, assists the board with the policy, also procedure, uh, looks at more of the nuts and bolts of the library, projects we can work on, partners we can partner with. Uh, we also, well, me as the library director also oversees, generally speaking, library services. Under the library director we have uh, three librarians, each of whom have uh, supervisory responsibilities and they also have a specialty area, if you like. So there's our references, uh, reference and technical services librarian. Uh, so her responsibilities are the reference desk upstairs, which provides a lot of information help uh, to patrons. She oversees technical services, to, so to the library that means uh, processing materials, getting them in our system and then ready to go on the shelf. Uh, she oversees that process. She also orders a lot of our, uh, our adult collection for the library. So under her, she has a cataloging technician who assists with the uh, inventorying of uh, materials. And then she has six reference clerks, and it's uh, important to note that each of these reference clerks has a specialty area. Right now we have two who work in outreach, we have um, one that is a bookkeeper, one that assists with interlibrary loans uh, that come from right across the country, and then we have one who also assists with technical services. Uh, we have our circulation librarian, 
uh, he, he does see a lot of those uh, basic operations of the library, check in, check out, getting books back on the shelf, and the circulation department's the most likely department uh, most patrons will interact with when they come into the library. They staff the front desk. Our youth services librarian, also known as the children's librarian, uh, oversees all our children's collections and programming. Uh, and she also has a collection of clerks and pages who assist with the children's library, which is in the downstairs space. We have uh, three coordinators, each with a specialty. We have a communications coordinator who oversees marketing, uh, both print and increasingly online social media marketing. Our IT coordinator oversees all our hardware and software at the library. And then our young adult services coordinator is also known as the teen librarian and providing uh, services to, uh, programming to teens as well as managing that collection. In all, we have 13 full-time employees and 17 part-time. I chose to do a review of 2020 uh, simply because you might have questions about what happened uh, that particular year and also it has a context for where we're at right now. So the impact of COVID-19 was that we were open to visitors for 32 weeks of the year, we were curbside only for 15 weeks and then we were uh, fully closed for five weeks. The Lake City Satellite Library has been closed since March 16. All that said, what it forced us to do was find new ways to connect with patrons, uh, despite the fact that we were limited in our uh, capacity to, to have people in the building, we still provided over 200,000 books, M materials in general, we checked out 200,000 books to the community, which is a solid number in my mind. Uh, and also we managed to keep on top of the programming commitments, uh, we switched to conducting programming virtually or in outdoor spaces, and our numbers ultimately were uh, pretty close to what they usually are because of that. Um, and honestly, pr virtual programming is probably a feature that will stay, um, at least in part, as we move forward. So just some stats to cover. Our door count, clearly well down uh, from previous years. Checkouts, again down, uh, but again, I'd like to stress again that we, we still managed ways to check materials out and get them in the hands of, of patrons. Our ebooks and e audiobooks is becoming um, a vital service that we provide. It experienced a bump last year. It's done gradually increased most years, so it's becoming a, a big part of what we offer in terms of the collection. Uh, and just to stress, these are ebooks, e audiobooks that uh, patrons can download onto their digital device or computer. Program attendance, as I said, it held fairly solid uh, thanks to virtual programming. Um, it was fairly consistent with last uh, 2019 numbers. So we didn't have a whole lot of in-person programming, but we found creative ways, particularly outdoors. So one of our successes was the Music on Monday uh, concert series that we held. Uh, they got pretty solid attendance uh, through the summer. Our pumpkin giveaway and decorating contest was a big success and no short part to uh, wastewater giving us literally hundreds of pumpkins uh, to give away. And then of course virtual programs was a big feature. So we, we provided our full range, we had preschool learning, uh, online gaming clubs for teens, book discussion groups, author talks, tech tips and story times and a whole lot of other stuff, one-off programming and series as well. So that brings us to 2021. Uh, so for the first few weeks of the year, we were curbside, uh, but we've now transitioned uh, to being open to visitors. Uh, we're fully reopened and we're getting really close to pre-pandemic uh, service levels in terms of attendance. Uh, programming is back in person. Uh, we're having events outdoors, inside, and also virtually. So we've got a range of options now for patrons. And just to go through some of those stats, so visitors, um, as you can see, it's bouncing back. We're fully expecting to have a, have a bounce back year, particularly next fiscal year. Uh, so that's increasing as time goes on. Checkouts, same trend, uh, really starting to get back to where we were. Ebooks and e-audiobooks are, are holding pretty steady. Uh, we're looking at another increase this year, um, as has been the trend. And then uh, just some of the programming that we're offering right now, our summer reading program is full steam ahead. Uh, we've got a uh, program for kids, um, different challenges each month. We've also got uh, an adult program and a teen program in place. 
Uh, we've had about 1,500 people sign up so far. Story times are back. They're either outside or indoors. Outreach, as I said, is becoming a huge part of what we do. We're at community events. We're going into the classroom. Uh, we're also participating in the CD re CDA Reads program, uh, partnering with the school district and, and other community partners. So some goals for the next uh, fiscal year. Uh, that outreach piece, we want to increase that uh, to, to schools, daycares, senior facilities, community centres, wherever there is a need, we'll try and get there. We want to improve the library's adults uh, and all ages programming output to complement our kids programming. I think we have a great range of kids and teen programs. Um, it's time to, to really focus on our adult and all ages programs as well. We want to modify and improve our marketing efforts. We've got a great new person in that role. Uh, with some really great ideas for getting the word out about what we're doing, uh, getting more people here. And then we want to add more digital tech, make it uh, equipment. As I said, we offer a whole different range of, of materials aside from books. We want to build on that, see what people want. We want to continue to assess features and services that enhance this library and its impact. We're always looking at new, uh, new ideas for the building, new services. Uh, create and strengthen partnerships to foster uh, collaborative opportunities within the community. And then uh, our ongoing quest is collection development. Um, so again, making sure that we have the materials that people in the community want. And then I, I thought I'd conclude with some ranks. I went back to 2018-19 in part because these are the last reported by the state. Um, and also it shows the potential of what the library can do. Uh, in a, a normal year. Uh, so we serve the ninth largest population in Idaho uh, and consistent with that we have the ninth uh, largest amount of visitors. Uh, circulation is 13, so that's an area certainly for us long term to focus in on. Ebooks is ninth, uh, program attendance is seventh. We're pretty proud of that. We want to continue that, um, providing good relevant programs for the community. Um, and the budget is the tenth largest in the state. And I stand for any questions. Well, thank you, and great presentation. I have one quick question. Could you tell me a little bit more about the Lake City branch and transitioning from that? I understand it was likely a challenge during COVID mm -hmm. in keeping two branches open with some restrictions, safety restrictions, and maybe making an assumption that played into it. But now that um, we're open back up, just the thought behind that and... Right, so initially it was basically the school decided uh, all third party vendors, as they called us, would cease within the school. So that was the initial decision there. Also, I mean, it made sense at the time. Moving forward, we're thinking uh, we'll wrap up services at Lake City uh, and we'll refocus that effort into outreach. Uh, so we're gonna add another outreach person we're finding that that's really where we um, experience growth, experiencing growth in terms of services. We're getting a lot of requests from schools individually to come and visit and do programs, uh, do presentations on what the library can offer, also offer information assistance. So we really wanna increase that, manage to meet the demand. Uh, and the Lake City branch, the Board of Trustees assessed it and just, just determined even pre-COVID, it wasn't quite achieving what it, the goals that were, were set forth. Uh, so we just want to redirect those services into an area that we are experiencing growth. Great, thank you. Well, a couple of things, and actually one might be budgetary, maybe for our city administrator too, as they um, mentioned, and we, we had a city council workshop recently, and went through all the department budgets and, and I think a question came up about the, the library. Some of this I've got some sense, but also for folks you know, who might be watching this. Um, the, so the library board puts together like departments a recommended budget, but uh, they don't have independent budget authority. Is that correct? As I understand it, and laid out in Idaho code, they present a budget, it is up to city council to approve that budget. Right. Right. Um, and then once it's approved, then they have authority over spending um, expenditures. Okay. So any um, 
kind of taxes that city residents pay for to support the library is through their city taxes. Um, and then uh, a city resident pays um, county taxes too <laughs> for services, but uh, I'm assuming city residents don't pay the other library district tax? As that? I understand it, ye, that's right. So there's, there's us as a city department uh, called Lane Public Library, and then there's the Community Library Network, which not strictly, but it, basically the county system. Yeah. Non incorporate, yeah. Um, so, um, okay, and then I guess the other one is just I'm aware, and you probably are too, I mean, time, time to time, uh, libraries and uh, materials have gotten controversial and, you know, questions about, you know, requests for censorship or this or that. Um, and it seems like we had some hot spot having to do with a boat, a book about a boat or something. <laughs> but have we had many, I mean, have you had to deal with many issues having to do with um, either why we have certain books or requests to ban books or, uh, or have we largely floated <laughs> through pretty good? Or? I haven't received, we do have a procedure for that. Uh, so we do have a review procedure. Okay. If, if, People, if they have concerns about certain materials that we have, they can uh, ask us for a, a formal uh, form that we have them fill out as much information about the book as possible, and then we do a review. Uh, the selector for that area takes a look, gives their input, I give my input, and then it goes to the Board of Trustees for review. Um, I have not received any requests okay. as of yet. Okay. Well, then you're doing better than the public <laughs> art, uh, Kadek folks. So, uh, <laughs> Okay, I think that's Great. all I have. And well, we really appreciate your time today and a great presentation, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, my pleasure. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. So. And we have now completed our agenda, and this meeting is adjourned. Great, okay.